How did you get to where you are? Who are you? I spent the majority of my life as the introverted IT guy. If I didn't know you, I wasn't talking to you. And by most people's standards, I was able to achieve some pretty significant things. Climbed that corporate ladder, made it all the way up to VP of IT, all from hiding behind my keyboard. I was just really good at the technology. I had been in IT for almost two decades at that point in time. as I wasn't fulfilled. I wasn't being challenged anymore. And the company that I was working with at the time, my first four years that I was there, we had four VPs of HR come and go. Leading human resources would probably be a challenge for an introverted IT guy. I'd like to put my head into the ring. That first year in leading human resources is what changed the entire trajectory of my life. What was your mindset in starting the podcast? I had this desire to share the lessons that I was learning along the way. I had to figure out how to overcome my fear of public speaking, talking to strangers that I had never met. Three and a half years of having the podcast and YouTube channel was doing more work on me than I was doing work on the podcast. Yes, sir. How are you? I'm fine. Thanks. I'm fine. Thanks. I actually want to say thank you so much for taking the time. You know, I don't take time for granted. So I really, really appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely. No, I, you know what? I appreciate you saying that because here's the thing we're all busy and mm. there is nothing worse than somebody showing up late or, you know, not respecting other people's time. So I definitely appreciate it. Mm. Awesome. Awesome. Um, well, look, it's great to have you, you here, Sean. You know, usually, we are here on the Rubasha Family Podcast, but like the way I've been doing a lot of these podcast conversations, it's like it's not even a podcast. It's a conversation. And, you know, I've I've been having a look at your journey, you know, and seeing you on LinkedIn and seeing the brand you've been able to build. You know, we have Sean Barnes here, you know, and I like your LinkedIn profile, building leaders and businesses, you know, at WSS Solutions, the CEO, the Way of the Wolf podcast, YouTube channel. What I like about you is I love your consistency. When I go to someone's YouTube channel, I don't care about the views. I don't care. I look at the consistency because that shows me about something. You look, you came up here on time, consistent. I can see a determination in you to build leaders. And I think this is a perfect time um, for me to have a conversation with you because I'm at a phase where, you know, we have a team and I'm in that CEO role. I'm, I'm leading it. And like when you're the leader, it's it's like everything's on you you know what I mean and so there's people like yourself who are teaching and empowering and listening to your YouTube video um really a lot of the advice that you gave and there's so many ways we can go about this conversation because I want to talk about that but I also want to talk about the podcasting and how you your, your genius strategy and what you've been able to do so anyway, yeah, welcome to the show, man. <laughs> man, I really appreciate it. I don't know if I would call it genius as much as just determination and consistency. Uh, there are so many times whenever I just realized, man, I wasted so much time doing this, this, or this. But then whenever I reflect on it, it wasn't a waste. It was just the piece of the journey that I was on at that point in time that was teaching me the lessons that I need to to know to be able to keep moving forward. So I, yeah, I'm really looking forward to us diving into this. Awesome. Awesome. So let's go back, man. Like, as I said, I, I really like your communication style. I love how you also tell stories within your communication. When you're talking about leadership, you always take it back to a story. So it puts us in that imagination. But can I go back to a little bit of your story about the people who don't know you, you know, like, how did you get to where you are? And, you know, who are you? Yeah, man. So let's see the the short version of this. I spent the majority of my life as the introverted IT guy. If I didn't know you, I wasn't talking to you. And I just always had a little bit of an inclination to lean into technology. And maybe that's just because I could hide behind my keyboard and monitor and still achieve great things that I, I knew I was meant for in my life. And by most people's standards, I was able to achieve some pretty significant things in the in corporate America. I kind of climbed that corporate ladder, made it all the way up to VP of IT for a publicly traded oil and gas company, all from hiding behind my keyboard. I was just really good at the technology. And in that functional domain, it's easy to ascend 
the ranks when you were just really good at what you do. And then in my mid thirties, I had been in IT for almost two decades at that point in time. And I just, I wasn't fulfilled. Uh, technology just came easy to me, had a good team. Things were just working well and ultimately realized that I wasn't being challenged anymore. Like I said, technology just came easy to me. And the company that I was working with at the time, my first four years that I was there, we had four VPs of HR come and go. It was just a revolving door. And, and I thought, you know what? Leading human resources would probably be a challenge for an introverted IT guy. Mm. I'd like to put my head into the ring, see if I can start trying to lead the human resources team. And it took some convincing with the senior leadership at the company that I was working for. But eventually, I convinced them to give me six months to a year to get the team into a good place. And then once we have some foundational stuff in place, I'll step back. I'll go back to just running IT only. We'll hire an HR executive. And I kind of mitigated the risk for the corporation by just saying, look, if it doesn't work, I'll, I'll back out. Now, that first year in leading human resources is what changed the entire trajectory of my life because I quickly realized I could not lead a team of HR professionals from behind my keyboard because HR people are very much people people. They want to hold eye contact. They want to have a conversation. They want to laugh. They want to engage. That wasn't who I was, but I had to develop skills around becoming a better conversationalist. I had to develop these soft skills that so many people think are, are elusive. And I think part of it is, look, let's just be real. Soft skills are skills. They can be learned. And effective communication comes down to maintaining eye contact, changes in pitch and tonality, using hand gestures. These are all individual skills, but when you bundle them together, it comes across as charisma. And so it's challenging for a lot of people to understand that. But over the years, I started to learn how to lean into developing these soft skills and then building and coaching others to help them become the best versions of themselves. And so now I actually, I left that company a year ago, started my own coaching and consulting firm. And that's really what we do. We just help build leaders that can build more leaders and build more businesses. So how did you know you would developing skills like what made you realize those were even skills in the first place you know honestly i think i just kind of fumbled into it it was just i know i need to do this thing and in talking with jason he's a people person i need to learn how to have a conversation with him and pick up the phone as opposed to sending him a team's message all the time and i think i didn't realize that in the moment i was just working like crazy just all the hours. And then I would pick up on cues like, okay, well, Jason likes it whenever I communicate with him in this way. And he's a really important member of the team. I need to do more of that. How do I get more comfortable making eye contact? How do I get more comfortable picking up the phone or doing a Zoom call with him as opposed to just messaging him online or texting him type of a thing? And so I think it was really my my desire to help them grow and realizing that I need to speak to them and I need to lead them in a way that they need to be led. And so along the way, I didn't recognize that I was building skills, but all that hard work that I was doing was actually doing more work on me than I was doing work on the work. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. It's so interesting because I put that to... You know, uh, um, so I, I call it football. Americans, they say soccer. But like you yeah. see great managers, you know, Sir Alex Ferguson and different players, he knew what to say to them to get that player going. So one player at halftime, he can come and tell him, hey, you need to step it up because he knows what gets him going. So it's interesting the fact that you were kind of put in that position where you said, okay, Jason responds well to this. And it may, it's a great feeling to see Jason be pumped up from what I just said. Okay, let me keep doing more of that. 
Um, so that's that's very interesting how you it's like you subconsciously develop like you subconsciously develop those skills in it. Yeah, it, it really is. And I think, you know, there's another layer to this. Mm -hmm. I, as many others, have experienced horrible leaders, undeveloped leaders throughout our career. I didn't have a whole lot of, we'll say, strong leadership role models, at least that that I had direct exposure to. And I've had very, very few mentors in my life. But I learned a lot about what not to do. Okay, well, he just ripped me to shreds and would yell at me and cuss at me. Don't want to do that. Okay, he micromanaged, and that was just a horrible feeling. Don't want to do that. Well, this guy, I never even hear from him. I'll go months without hearing from him. So I had a, plenty of examples of what not to do. And so I kind of had to find my own way and figure out what worked with the people on my team. And the driver was, I don't want to be like that. I don't want to be like that. And I definitely don't want to be like this over here. But what's so unfortunate about it is I think that's an experience that a lot of people have. They have horrible managers throughout their career, but not a lot of strong role models. And that's part of the reason that I wanted to start the podcast is just to share the lessons that I've learned to like, hey, this works well, this doesn't work well, to raise that level of awareness. And once you're able to raise that level of awareness, people can then start to adjust their actions accordingly and start moving in a direction that will be better for them and their team. Okay. I I have two questions now because, you know, coming, going back from what you said. So let's say for a leader, how are you able to harness or keep empowering your staff in terms of communicating with them but when you're so busy when you have so many things that you're going on and you're all focused on building the business it could be so easy to you know and I can speak that from my experience like I do really well to tap in with them but it can be easy to just get lost off in your own world so how do you manage that is that now like I, for example I have now an executive assistant who does help me now manage those calls and things like that which is that helps me so much so yeah, what would be your advice on the CEOs, the leaders out there who, you know, they know they need to do this and have those communication skills, but they're also in their own mind and you have your personal life and, and things going on? Well, I think you're already starting to figure this out. You just mentioned you have an executive assistant that's helping with coordination and organizing events, which, by the way, she's phenomenal. I've had a few interactions, just her staying on top of things fantastic as far as coordination for the podcast. So keep keep doing that. But I think this kind of dovetails into the delegation conversation. Mm -hmm. And I have a lot of conversations and whenever I speak on panels and things like that, where people will, will ask the question, I'm just so busy. How do I find time to do this, this, and this? If you are that busy, it's an indication that you're probably not delegating enough. Mm -hmm. And for those of us that have gone out on our own and starting our own business, there's, there's a little bit of a challenge that we face. Presumably, we left corporate America or our big job because we didn't have enough control. So now I start my own business. I have control of everything. Great. Once you start to grow that business, you have to let go of control of some things to the people on your team. So the very thing that you left your corporate job for to have control, you now have to let go of so that you can grow and scale your business. Mm -hmm. And when it comes to delegation, a lot of business owners and leaders struggle with that because they have this mindset of, well, nobody can do it the way I can. I'm, I'm just, I'm, it, it has to be done this way. All right, fair. But one of the things that has served me well in terms of how do we delegate or how do I delegate this, this, and this is making sure that one, you're training the people on your team. Mm -hmm. And I don't mean having one 15 minute conversation, hey, go do this, and then expecting them to know what you've learned over a 10, 15 year span of time. So you have to be able to train them in a way so that they actually understand what they're doing, why they are doing it, and then setting up guardrails. 
And I like to envision this kind of like a bowling alley where you've got two, you've got gutters on each side. Our end goal is we need to have this thing done. So you roll that ball, don't go in the gutter. Here's your boundaries that you can't, you can go anywhere you want to within this lane as long as you achieve the ultimate goal. Don't go in the gutter, don't jump the gutter because if you do, then there's going to be some sort of accountability. And what you will find when you start training your employees on how and explaining the why and then empower them to get the thing done, there will be times when they actually surprise you and they will get it done in a different way, better way or faster way than you knew. That's fantastic. Pat on the back. You did great. Do more of that. And there will also be times when they mess it up. And that's when you, as the leader, have to come in and say, okay, this is what happened. Here's the ideal outcome. We set these guardrails. You jumped it. We need to make sure that that doesn't happen again. And as long as you keep them on this path while also giving them the freedom and autonomy to kind of find their own way, eventually, on a long enough time horizon, they're going to figure out what you need and then deliver time and time again. And then they're actually going to appreciate that more than you can possibly imagine. And they're going to want to go above and beyond to keep doing more. Mm, wow, powerful. So so can you talk now about your journey of leaving, you know, your job, the parachute flying off and then going into, you know, <laughs> where you are now? Yeah, that, you know, this was a very challenging decision for me because I grew up as a kid with no money. It was very challenging for us growing up. And as I started to progress in my career and started earning more and more money, admittedly, in my late 20s, early 30s, I went through a phase where it was just a party, just making it rain, buying cars and jet skis and all the toys. Wow. And then I realized, okay, well, this isn't very fulfilling. And once I got that out of my system, I started living well below my means. And, you know, I have I have nice vehicles just because I like nice vehicles, but it's I still live well below my means. And I just started saving and saving and saving because I knew one day I didn't know when, but I knew one day I was going to go out and do my own thing. Mm -hmm. And admittedly, my former employer, they, they paid me very, very well. And not many people know how much they paid me. But whenever I had a conversation with my family and said, OK, I'm going to leave and then go do this thing, there was kind of a, mm -hmm. are you, you sure you want to walk away from that? And, you know, I had reasons for wanting to leave. But then what was more powerful for me was my mission to go do something big and help even more people, businesses, and teams grow and become the best versions of themselves. So I had this, this calling and I couldn't ignore it anymore. So about a year ago, a little over a year ago, I had the conversation with the senior leadership. They had, they tried to get me to stay for a little while. And I said, Hey, this is, this is really important to me. I have to do this. And so very respectful, I set up a six month transition time where kind of, we took my IT team, rolled them under the CFO. We took the ESG team, rolled them under VP of strategic development and HR safety, transportation and the PMO and leadership development. They hired another VP to take those functions. So over that six month span of time, I gradually transitioned all of my teams over to other leaders in the business and then started WSS. And, you know, there's a few things that I think are important for people to understand because I, I've been very open and public about my journey of leaving corporate America and then starting a business. And I've done that through the podcast, but there's a lot of people out there that are frustrated with their boss or employer and want to go start their own business. So I've kind of started coaching and guiding and helping some people in that arena but the first thing I ask them is, why do you want to do this? Because if you don't like your boss, if you don't like your company, that is not a reason to go start your own business. You start a business because you've got a fire in your soul that is hotter than hot to do this thing. Mm -hmm. Because you are going to need that fire. You're going to need that intrinsic motivation 
to weather the storms that are going to happen. It doesn't matter how good you are at your craft. You can be the best engineer or software developer in the world. If you don't know how to market, if you don't know how to generate leads and sell and service the work and invoice and handle and build a team, that is going to be very challenging for you because these are all aspects of business ownership. So me transitioning out, the biggest thing that I missed out on was the importance of building skills around selling. Mm -hmm. And I had unintentionally started building skills around building a brand through the podcast. Because having the podcast three and a half, I'm closing in, let's see, three and a half years now of having the podcast. And I started to, to develop a brand and reputation for showing up every single week rain or shine whether i'm sick or not the the episode that dropped last week or two weeks ago I, I mean i was sick as can be you can hear it in my voice every single week i show up and deliver that was building a brand of consistency for myself now i've been able to carry that through to wss and the company that we're building but that has been the most challenging aspect for me is understanding more about sales and customer acquisition. So that's marketing, branding, lead generation, sales, sales cycles, things like that. That was probably a miss on my part. I underestimated how much knowledge I was lacking in that domain. And I'm starting to get more comfortable with it and we'll eventually end up hiring dedicated salespeople. But one of the things that has served me well is every time I step into leading a new functional domain, when I did this with HR and then safety and then transportation and then ESG, and every single time I go into leading a new functional domain, I spend six to 12 months going all in to learn everything I possibly can about it. Then I either build the talent to service that or buy the talent. So hire talent. So you can say, I've got this person on my team. They're going to grow into our brand manager and marketing person. I'm going to coach, build, mentor, develop her so that she can do it. We don't really have an in-house skill set around sales or being dedicated to sales. I'm learning the skills and we will eventually hire a dedicated salesperson. But this is another myth that I think a lot of newly minted entrepreneurs struggle with is I need a salesperson. So they go hire a salesperson that says they're great at sales. They keep them on payroll for six months and they haven't closed a single deal. So presumably they did that because they didn't know enough about mm. sales and they got sold that this person was going to come in and save their business. Mm -hmm. So it's important for you to understand where are the gaps? What are you going to need to know mm -hmm. when it comes to building your business and surrounding yourself with excellence with other entrepreneurs, whether it's masterminds or group chats or dinners or whatever you've got to do, surround yourself with people are, that are in that space and just be an absolute sponge. Learn everything that you possibly can and know that even in doing that, when you do your own thing, it's still not going to be enough and you're going to have to figure out even more. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I see some similarities with our journey a little bit, just because like, like me, I've just been a content creator. Like I, I was, you know, I was just on YouTube, right? Like I was playing sport, being an athlete and, you know, and just doing that consistently led into it in the business and now managing what we're doing. So like with the sales, like, you know, going out and having to get clients, like I, it just, it was foreign to me. You know what I mean? Like I just prefer to just, this is what I love doing. And even with the sales, like I'm not the best at it still. Like I have just said, I actually promised myself, I'm going to be out there teaching and doing and working with our clients so much that people are going to come to me in a way. And, and I can always improve, but so I see a lot of similarities there. And, and also what you said, even about, you know, when you learn how to do something, same as editing, I know how to edit. So now when we bring that, you can't tell me, like, I know 
and I'm getting a bang for my buck too because you can't tell me it can't get done. <laughs> Move out of the way. I'll I'll do it. Do you know what I mean? And every role yep. like in the business I can do. You know what I mean? Yep. So I think that's so true. Like you said, a lot of people make that mistake where, you know, you 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 do that. Um. So that's very interesting. What was your mindset in starting the podcast? Like, like, how did that, how did that even come about? You know? Yeah. So like I mentioned earlier, I've spent the majority of my life as an introvert. And as I started growing and learning more about leadership development and business, I wanted to share the lessons that I had learned. So ultimately, the reasoning, there's two reasons that I started the podcast. One, I had this desire to share the lessons that I was learning along the way. Second, or more important, is I had to figure out how to overcome my fear of public speaking, my fear of talking to strangers that I had never met. And so I was having a friend or a conversation with a friend at the gym who had a podcast and I was talking through this with him and he's like, yeah, why don't you start a podcast and a YouTube channel? And in the moment I was like, Oh, whoa. Oh no. Why would I do that? And he just kind of looked at me. I was like, mm. okay. All right. So I thought about it, started doing some research, started analyzing. I'm, I'm a techie at, by nature and I have, had a tendency to suffer from analysis paralysis where I just overanalyze, overanalyze, overanalyze. So a month goes by. I see him at the gym. I said, All right, perfect. I'm going to go ahead. I'm going to start a podcast, going to drop an episode every two weeks. Like I was so proud of myself. And he looked at me and said, really, you're going to change the world with one episode every two weeks. <sighs> fine, fine. I'll do it every week. And then create clips and reels and stuff like that daily off of it. And man, I leave the episodes up from three and a half years ago. If you go back and sort by oldest and you could see, oh man, dude, they were brutal. The notes and my microphone set up here. So the camera was right here and I would just legitimately read my notes. I didn't even have bullets as talking points. I would just read my notes. Like it was, it was horrible. So this is another example of how three and a half years of having the podcast and YouTube channel was doing more work on me than I was doing work on the podcast. It has turned me into a better conversationalist. I can now go to conferences and speak on stages and it just, it just flows naturally. And I've, because I've had so many guests on as interviews, I've been able to figure out how to extract relevant information out of them. Because as you are well aware, some people, they're like a locked vault. You ask them a question, yes. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay, well, how about this? Oh, no. Oh, all right. Some people don't want to open up at all, and then others just simply won't shut up. Mm -hmm. So you have to learn how to command the conversation to drive it in a meaningful way. And on a podcast, this is you and I having a conversation, hopefully to educate the audience. But when you're at a networking event, being intentional about where do I want this conversation to go? And quickly developing skills around where does this person fall? Potential partner or referral person that we can just kind of network with and share customers back and forth? Or is this the potential employee in the future? And once you learn how to size people up, then you can start driving the conversation in a meaningful direction that is mutually beneficial. Mm. I don't know if that answered the question. Sometimes I go down rabbit holes. No, 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 no. I, I love that. I love that. It's because it's like, like, I just see it's, I just relate to it so much. And even just to add on that, like, when like being a podcast host and I started with my parents, right? Like when I started, it was, oh, wow. Like, you're not just mom and dad. Like, like you're a human being. Like you, you, you guys are human. You know what I mean? Like literally, like I sat on the, like it, it changed the podcast changed my life because I'm sitting with mom and dad and I'm just like, you know, mom, well, you mean mom cried one, like, you know, and, and I was just being curious, but I was developing this skill of being present and listening. 
being present and listening, letting people talk. And I didn't know what I was doing. So like you said, now when I'm out in public, every conversation is like a podcast for me. And, and all the things that you just said there, you're able to match up. You know, you're able to see where is this conversation going. You're able to listen. And that's why for me, I literally just document everything. Kind of like Gary Vee. I have the camera going everywhere. I told the person, hey, it's real. because like it's just it's so powerful. And 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 the these skills are so transferable, like you said. So you're wondering the value in being a podcast guest. Think about it. You want to build your personal brand. Is it important as ever? And coming on this show allows you to do just that. You're able to leverage our audience, but not not only that, you're able to leverage the content from this podcast as you clock up the hours someone spends with you. The longer time someone spends listening to your story, your solutions in the marketplace allows you to do something special. It allows you to build a community and build a brand. You can leverage the community here, but you can also leverage the content from this show to be able to use where? on LinkedIn. LinkedIn is where you're going to shine. LinkedIn is where you're going to generate leads. So whoever you are, you want to come and tell your story. You want to be able to come in and be a guest that allows you to build your brand. Link in the description. We'll get in touch. So join our waiting list to feature on the Rabasha Family Podcast. Um, I, I do want to ask you, um, how have you felt three years as a pod? like doing what you're doing, how, what effect have you seen on your personal brand? How is, how do you feel that scene come into your business? If, if there is any. Yeah. So there's, a, there's a few elements at play here. One of the things that as I was transitioning out, I had this mindset of, well, I've got this podcast. Everybody knows who I am, what I'm about. Customers are just going to start raining down on me. And I quickly learned that having the podcast and creating all the content doesn't generate a lot of leads, but it is phenomenal from a lead nurture perspective. Mm -hmm. Now, as far as what has it done for my personal brand, it has helped me hone in on B because it is important for us to have a target, whatever that is. I never even considered what is my brand because when people hear brand, they think, they think Nike, things like that. And ultimately I've come to realize that brand is just associations. Mm. So I started to figure out what do I want to be associated with? And early on in the podcast, like you, I would just have friends come on as guests and some business owners and things. And I talked about fitness, talked about cars, racing cars, like hobbies, and then some business. And over time, I came to realize that I light up whenever I talk about leadership and business. And so I want to be more intentional about creating more and more and more of that leadership and business content to create that association with Sean Barnes in the way of the wolf. But this is an Another thing that I kind of stumbled into and figured out over time, and you know, you hear people on podcasts talking about it, but until you live it, that is when you cement that idea into your psyche, into in, into who you are. So in terms of helping me develop and build my personal brand, now people jokingly, oh, hey, it's the Wolfman, he just showed up type of a thing, because I have been type of content that now people have this association with Sean Barnes, leadership, consistency, dedication, business. These are who I want to be known for, things that I want to be known for. And I had to curate that brand over all of these years of just consistently showing up day in and day out. Now, I want to elaborate a little bit more on a lesson that I learned, the vanity metrics of views and likes on social media. Now, let me elaborate a little bit. <clears throat> For three and a half years, I hammered Instagram and Facebook trying to grow my followers. Mm -hmm. Every single day, carousels, posts, reels, clips, resharing, tagging, all 
everything in my power on Insta on the meta platforms. And whenever I looked back over the metrics, three and a half years, I gained one ish net follower per day. So after three years, I'm still sitting at less than 2000 followers on Instagram. And then one day I looked over to LinkedIn where I wasn't even trying and had twice as at the time, I think I had 4,500 followers and I was neglecting LinkedIn. I barely post anything on there. And that's whenever it hit me. We have to be intentional about how we use each platform because on face on meta platforms and TikTok, people are there from an escapism perspective. And I see you shaking your head. You just released an episode on this. Yeah, yeah. You have to be intentional about how you use each platform, the meta, you know, those social media platforms, people are there from an escapism perspective. Very few go there for leadership and business advice. Some do, but very few. Now, whenever I look at my LinkedIn presence that I'm being intentional about creating more content for people on that platform, I, I net increase anywhere from 14 to 16 followers per day on LinkedIn and have been for the past 10 months. I actually posted a graphic two months ago just showcasing when you are focused on this, on this platform, you're going to skyrocket because that, that's where people's mindset is at. When they are on LinkedIn, they want to learn. They want to grow. They want to be better at business and leading their teams. And so just kind of lessons that I've learned, I still do post some stuff on Meta and TikTok and stuff like that, but we're leaning all in on LinkedIn because that's where our customers are at. And that's really their mindset is primed for the type of content that that resonates with me and that I like to create. And and if you think about it, like I've I've had you as a connection for a while and yep, I, I yeah. see your content, right? Because not many people are doing it. And I had the same journey. I wasn't really like, was I really, even me, like I'm less than even 2000 followers similar. Um, I wasn't really kind of worried about that because I just know it's just, hey, it's a numbers game. I just put it out there because I know, you know, it's distribution. I'm not emotional about these platforms. Same as YouTube. I'll get five views. I don't care. It's distribution, right? There's someone out there who's going to watch it. So I'm quite passionate about YouTube particularly, but yeah, so and even right now, the other social platforms, I noticed TikTok is still sometimes good for SEO. Like you can still rank. So it's just to have a presence there, but you're right. Like to really be intentional. And and I be, the same thing that yeah. clicked in for me, it was actually Gary V. I saw a video one time. I say this a lot. He said, post on LinkedIn for nine months straight and it's going to change your life. And it did change my life, right? Or like, look at me and you here. How would have I would have, would have, I wouldn't have connected with you if, you yep. know, maybe on another platform, me and you were here. This is powerful. We're having a podcast conversation yep. you know, with quite similar um, interests and I can learn from you, you know, through LinkedIn and like, like, and, and even going back to what you said earlier, you're right. When you have a podcast, it's not something that you're just going to generate, you know, leads. I think over a 20, 30, 40 year period. Yes. You know, that's when, you know, you will be able to generate, you know, that's powerful. Cause you know, I, like I say, your podcast is a media company. Um, so, um, but yeah, going back to that, yeah, like really being intentional about the distribution, you know, and, and, and where you're going. So I do want to ask you, like, I do see you, you're doing conferences, workshops. What's that like? What's, where are you now? Where, where is Sean now? And where are you going? What does five, 10 years look like for you? Before I, I answer that, I have to commend you in thinking in decades instead of weeks or months. Far too many people fall into the trap of wanting instant results, and it's people like yourself that focus on how do I do this over 10 years, over 20 years, over 30 years, and mentally are prepared to understand all great things come with time. Mm -hmm. So first of all, kudos to you on that. Mm -hmm. Now, as far as where I am at right now, yes, I have started going to more conferences. And this is also, in terms of my attendance at conferences, it was kind of over, we'll say a five year span of time, it was like this up. And then when I started my business, it dropped off. And now it's starting to pick up. 
Reason being, when I was the VP of corporate operations for a publicly traded oil and gas company, I got invited to a lot of conferences, CIO, CHRO, just executive conferences. And once they started to pick up on me having a knack for engaging the people in the audience, they wanted me to sit on more panels and then eventually give little workouts, uh, uh, breakout sections, sessions, and then eventually doing keynotes. Whenever I left my former employer to start my own business, a lot of these companies that host these events, it's free for executives at large companies to attend and speak at. But if you were on the service provider side, coach, consultant, product sell, you sell in product, something like that, then you have to pay to sponsor the event to then get on stage. Mm. And unfortunately, as a startup, I didn't have five, ten, fifty thousand dollars to sponsor one event to go stand on stage. Mm. And so unfortunately, I didn't get many chances for the first six months. Now, there have been more and more people reaching out to me because I'm creating more of that content that are just simply asking, hey, will you come be a speaker? Will you be our master of ceremonies? On and on. And right now, it's it's still pro bono stuff because I'm trying to get the reps in, get the content, get the exposure. Eventually, I'm going to tr start trying to transition more into paid speaking engagements. Mm. But one of the things that I think these community organizers appreciate is when I get on stage, when I'm the master of ceremonies, whenever I'm sitting on a panel, I'm not trying to sell anything. I straight up tell them, if I have a presentation, I don't have to put my company logo on there. I don't have to put my podcast. I am there from a thought leadership perspective. Now, if somebody wants to come up to me after I speak and exchange business cards, great. But I'm not there to just cram something down all of the audience's throat, trying to force them to buy something. And so they appreciate that because ultimately people don't want to be sold to, and especially if they go to a conference. So I'm doing more and more of these conferences, just leaning into thought leadership, having conversations like this, talking about topics like this to inspire and influence others. So five to 10 years, we're going to continue building WSS. We're a small company right now. We've got four full-time employees and then a couple of contractors right now. Mm -hmm. But we're going to continue building WSS. I'm going to continue building my personal brand and the podcast. And then eventually I have ideas for other businesses that I want to start. But I also understand how easy it is to get sidetracked by the newest and shiniest thing. I've got two other business ideas that I will launch when the time is right. Mm -hmm. And admittedly, when I first started WSS, I'm like, okay, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. And these other companies. And then I quickly realized launching a business, you have to be singularly focused on that business. Mm -hmm. And when you go on LinkedIn and see CEO of company A, CEO of company B, CEO mm -hmm. of company C, and a, B, and C don't have any employees. That right there tells me they're, they're so scatterbrained that they likely can't deliver at a high level on any of those things. So success comes from being six, singularly focused on that thing that you want to accomplish. All of these other opportunities that pop up around investing and starting and building other companies, they will always be there. And we have this fear of missing out. But the reality is, if you spread yourself too thin, if you spread yourself beyond one, I'm going to say one company, then the likelihood of success for all of them just continues to diminish the more you spread yourself thin. Mm -hmm. So continue to build my brand, continue to build the podcast, continue to build WSS. And then when WSS gets to a point where it is self-sustaining and self-sufficient, then I will consider starting and launching one of my other business ideas that I have. And my litmus test there is if I can step away from the company completely for six months and it continue to grow then I will know that we have built the team and the processes to ensure that it continues to scale.
If I step away and it stays flat or goes down, I know I haven't done a good enough job in building the team or the processes for it to be self-sustaining. And I have to go back in and keep doing that thing. Mm -hmm. I have one quick question. So, and this is a piece of advice. So you talk about being singly focused. Let's say, put it in my perspective, like I'm building the business. We have our clients. What's the difference between me now saying, well, can I go and still create other revenue streams? So for example, consulting or speaking, going and doing workshops and come and still in the same of what I'm talking about, personal branding and social media, am I being sidetracked off? Like, like what's your advice on that? Yeah, I think that this is an area where it's a little bit more nuanced than starting an So as an example, mm -hmm. one of the other businesses that I talked about was starting an exotic car rental business. Now that is completely different from coaching and consulting, right? Mm -hmm. So that's easy to kind of draw that line of delineation. But mm -hmm. to your point, I'm kind of in a similar place. How much time do I allocate to public speaking? How much time do I allocate to coaching? How much time for consulting? And admittedly, because of my experience over the years, when we launched our company, our website had leadership development, IT consulting, HR consulting, safety consulting, transportation consulting, ESG consulting. I was like, oh, God. Yeah, we can't be great at any of these. So we gradually started to niche it down. And so now we have two primary verticals. We have coaching and then the HR consulting with some IT consulting. And the consulting is all handled by my number two in the business. Her name is Crystal. She's phenomenal, just off the charts brilliant. I know and can trust that she can deliver on the consulting. I know and trust in myself on the coaching side of things. So we kind of divide and conquer. She runs the operations of our, our company and does the consulting stuff. And then I do all of the coaching and media, public speaking side of things. It's important for you to understand what is the highest leverage use of your time. Mm -hmm. Getting on stages is a beautiful way to build your brand and raise awareness and get more exposure. That doesn't always immediately directly generate revenue, though. Mm -hmm. So you have to balance that with what are the revenue needs of the business today? How much time can Sean spend on stages versus how much time does Sean need to spend actually coaching people and directly generating revenue? And so being aware of where you allocate your time and ensuring that that aligns with the needs of the business today is the first step. And it's easy to get sucked into the things that you love doing. For you, you love editing videos and creating content. Mm -hmm. How much revenue is that generating for you and your business? Mm -hmm. Well, we could assume that creating the content, if you're doing it for customers, that's directly generating revenue. Mm -hmm. But when you generate content for yourself and for your show, it's indirectly generating revenue, which doesn't hit the financials until at you know some point in the future. So being aware of what is the highest leverage use of my time today and then planning accordingly so that you can kind of work yourself out of that position in the future. And this is the biggest thing that I see entrepreneurs struggle with. They're great at their craft. They love doing this thing, but it's not what the business needs or the business needs you to bring somebody else in to do that piece so that you can focus on the next big thing for the business and for the team. Mm. Wow, I think that I think that last one was really powerful and it resonated quite a lot, right? You get you get stuck in doing what you love, right? And you know, the content and the marketing and you love it, love it. And sometimes I can't even stop myself if I even tried, you know what I mean? But like, yes, what what I'm reading a book right now called Lazy CEOs and it talks a lot about that. You know, what are the constraints that you have within the business and how can you now focus on those constraints to to take your business forward? 
Yeah. I mean, ultimately, as you scale a business, the, a skill that is important to develop is identifying and unlocking the constraints in your business. And this also is contingent upon you having skills on being able to go down and in and understand a problem and then back away and then look up and out and understand where are we going? How do, how do I continue moving the business forward as opposed to me just staying down and in all the time? And those are skills that need to be developed because as you start delegating, there will be times when you have to sit down with Jason and show him step-by-step step how to make this thing happen. Once you're comfortable that he understands and can deliver, you can't keep doing that thing because you're passionate about it. You have to, you have a responsibility to yourself, to your business and to your team to then step back, take a holistic view of everything that's going on. Oh, well, now I've got to work with Sally, get Sally where she needs to be, step back. Oh, now I have to keep focusing on our vision and mission and how we move this thing forward. So in, out, in, out, forward. You have to develop skills around being that chameleon and adapting to whatever the business needs. And that's challenging to do. It comes with time and experience. And it's only until we experience enough pain of staying where we're at that that pain is more significant than the pain of learning and changing and growing. That is the only point at which we will actually start leaning in to learning new skills, reading, trial and error, better understanding how to look up and out and build our business. Mm. Perfect, perfect. Sean, I think this has been a fantastic conversation. Honestly, I think we can we could talk all day. Um, I'll, you know, I definitely love this exchange and you know, to be able to just build this relationship, you know, when I come out to America, do another podcast, you know, just keep having these powerful conversations because not only did I learn so much about leadership, about mentality, you know, um, even just that business advice, like to really how can we all empower each other on this journey? So honestly wanted to thank you so much for this. And, you know, I can't wait for us to share this with the world. And, you know, I think, you know, we'll put your description in the details, right? Like people do, you know, leadership, everything starts with leadership. And what I like about what you said, it's not about developing followers per se, it's about developing other leaders, you know, to go on and develop other leaders, you know? So, and that's what you're doing and shout out to you, man. And, and thank you so much for, for coming on the show. I appreciate the opportunity, man. Truly, truly do. I know we've been connected for a few years on LinkedIn mm -hmm. and admittedly got excited for this opportunity. So thank you so much for, for having me come on and then having such an incredible conversation. And yes, if you make it here to the States, we have to hook up. We'll record a podcast in person and make that happen. For sure, for sure, for sure. All right, Sean, I'll let you get to it. And um, yeah, have a great day. All right, man. Thank you. Thanks, man. If you really enjoyed this video, make sure to click here and I'm sure you're going to love that one.